Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for this uh, important event this afternoon. This is uh, one of our series of seminar uh, from the Construction Informatics and uh, Digital Enterprise Laboratory at uh, Leeds Beckett University. So uh, today uh, we we are really blessed to have uh, a known speaker within the digital engineering and digital construction area, a leading expert in our field, uh, of course, uh, very well known. We have uh, Professor uh, Luanis Brilakis uh, from University of Cambridge, who is going to be leading us uh, today and be uh, presenting on a topic titled Digital Twin in the Boot Environment. So Professor Brilakis is uh, well known in this area, as I mentioned. Uh, he has uh, executed a lot of projects within this area. When we talk about the digital twin within the boot environment, uh, we are going to be referring to Professor Brilakis uh, in this area. Uh, he's currently at the Langerook Professor of Civil and uh, Information Engineering at the University of Cambridge. Uh, equally, is the Director of the Construction Information Technology Laboratory at the Division of Civil Engineering uh, within the uh, University of uh, Cambridge. Professor Brilakis has uh, executed uh, a lot of externally funded projects by different council within the UK, within Europe and internationally. So he's well known in this uh, area and uh, he has received a significant number of uh, awards uh, within this uh, digital engineering. So without wasting time, I'm going to be uh, inviting him to start uh, in a minute. Uh, but before then, I would like to let you know that this event is being uh, recorded and the attendees are going to be receiving the recorded uh, lecture so presented by Professor Brilakis. So we are here, we are very excited to be benefiting from his wealth of experience uh, when it comes to digital training uh, within the uh, boot environment. And I hope you are going to enjoy it as much as we are hoping to enjoy it as well. So I'll be handing over to Professor Brilakis to, to lead us. And uh, towards the end, uh, we are going to be reading out the question. I have my colleagues here who are going to be monitoring the chats and uh, we are going to read out your question. If you have any question, feel free to put it in the chat and uh, we are going to read it out so that the uh, our guest speaker is going to be able to answer any question that you have uh, on this uh, lecture. And uh, I will hand over to Professor Brilakis to, to start. Uh, thank you very much once again for joining us today. Thank you, Sahid, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I hope everyone can see uh, my screen. Um, I will be only seeing my screen from now on, so I won't be able to see you. If um, there is any issues, any concerns, speak out, please, because I want I will only be able to hear the microphone. So um, switching on to the slides. And um, the topic. Digital twinning the built environment, so. What I will explain to you in, in this context is. Two things. The first one is very easy and all of you understand it, and that is what is built environment? What do we mean by it? But the second one, that's the one where we're, we're going to spend most of our time is the digital twinning side. What is that? What does it mean for us? What do we have to do to get value out of it? Uh, but before I get into all that, um, just to highlight, uh, um, and as the introduction said, I'm Yanis Brilakis. I'm a language professor at the University of Cambridge. I work for this very interesting place that was founded in uh, 1209 by King Henry III. Um, I have here some pictures from um, Corpus Christi at the top and Trinity and Kings at the bottom. Uh, if you've ever been to Cambridge, you might have seen some of these sites. Um, the picture there for Trinity uh, shows a descendant of Isaac Newton's apple tree that's right in front of his office. Um, and speaking of Isaac Newton, uh, the university is very well known for a number of eminent mathematicians, scholars, heads of state, actors and so on. You probably recognize some of the faces there down in the bottom, uh, but the ones at the top include uh, Niels Bohr, Charles Darwin, George Stokes, John Maynard Keynes, John Harvard, who founded Harvard, uh, our recently departed Stephen Hawking and others. Um, in contrast to the history, the presence of the university, our new buildings look like this, and this is where we are, the Civil Engineering Building. And 
what you might notice here is that this building could be anywhere on the planet. There's absolutely nothing Cambridge about this facility. And, and this is where modern architecture is converging today. Um, it is a globalized profession and we are building the same things across the globe, which is in, in a sense a good thing, but also it, it, it slightly lacks character, uh, which is something that Cambridge is very well known for. Now, having said that, I'll jump straight to our topic. Like I promised you, I'll start with built environment first. What we mean by built environment is economic infrastructure, roads, tunnels, bridges, rails, dam, and so on, social infrastructure, housing, hospitals, schools, prisons, and so on, and the interface with the natural environment. All of that is within the remit of the built environment. Now let's talk about digital twinning. Um, digital twins are absolutely at the core of the digital transformation of what's happening these days within the industry. And the reason is that digital twins have the promise, the potential to give us better performance in terms of cost, time, quality, safety, sustainability, resilience, and so on, help us achieve net zero and all the rest. We are doing one thing and one thing only, better information management. And this is the one thing I want you to take out of this lecture. Digital twinning is all about improving information management. Having said that, if I was to discuss with you and ask each one of you what is a digital twin, I will probably get a lot of different answers. And that's because it's a new topic, so we don't quite understand it very well yet. So what I've done uh, uh, over the last few years is to try to get to the bottom of this. When we say digital twin, just what exactly do we mean and what does that mean for us? So. I'll start with something very fun foundational, very basic. Imagine uh, a one year old child that's learning how to walk. Uh, the child takes the wrong step as a result of that. So that's an action. That action leads to the child falling. And it's painful. That's the impact and the signal that comes back to the brain. Um, the child then processes in the brain what that means. So I took that step and it led to that outcome. And it gave me that signal of pain and I didn't get to my target. Therefore, it was the wrong decision to make. That's knowledge. And then using that knowledge, I start. Predicting what might come next. So what if I put my foot here next time or there or there? That happens really fast, of course, in our brain. But this is really the mechanism that we have. To make a decision to let all the bad options die in our head and then use the most viable one to move forward. The same exact thing happens with engineering. Uh, the difference is that we cannot possibly process everything in our mind because the types of structures we are trying to design, build, operate, maintain are very, very complex. So we outsource a part of that mind into the computer, the planned asset, which is what we would call the digital twin. So again, you have the same thing. You have the physical asset, which is the road, the bridge, the building and so on, which is the equivalent of the body. And then you have the planned asset, which is the equivalent of the brain or more specifically the prefrontal cortex, which is what um, boys don't have until the age of 25, I believe. So. What happens within that space is that we monitor the physical asset, we produce data, we interpret that data in the plant asset into knowledge. We use that to make forensics and forecasting predictions, make decisions, and then use that to send instructions back to the physical asset so we can act upon it and produce some impact. Now, I don't think I've told you anything new. Uh, you already know all of this. The only difference is that within that space, um, now we can give better definitions. First of all, what is then a digital twin? Well, the digital twin is that thing on the right, the planned asset. And what then is the other thing? Well, there is a reason why we call it a twin. 
the twin has to do with the number two. It's not a triplet, it's not a quadruplet. The twin of it is the physical asset. That's the physical twin. So then if we have a digital twin and a physical twin, what do you call the combination? The whole thing and the arrows together that join them. Well, that's what we call a twin system. So keep this in your mind. The thing on the left is the physical twin. The thing on the right is the digital twin. And the combined thing is the twin system. Now with these definitions, we can move forward a lot better. First of all, why do we need these digital twins? Well, that's what, because we want to increase automation to manage increasing asset complexity, to combine the product and the process, to combine the modeling, the simulation, the monitoring, and the automation all in the same platform. And as a result of that, this is all too complex and expensive, making these kinds of digital twins, uh, designing them, constructing, maintaining, operating them is very expensive, but you get a rich outcome that's very valuable, able to serve multiple processes. Another element is that um, these digital twins are now going to be federated. We are well beyond the world point where we could keep everything as a single model. That just doesn't work anymore if we want to go across life cycle stages. So we have to be able to work with data that comes from separate sources and are not natively combined. Um, we also want to make sure that they are extensible and future-proofed. Now, why this is very important, an example I can give is uh, the car industry has taken a very different path. Uh, 30 years ago, cars were mechanical things that we could run for 20 years, sometimes more. These days, cars are becoming more like a computer, especially electric cars are literally a computer. Um, and therefore, the life cycle of the car is not too different from the life cycle of technology. Now, for a car, that's easy to do. All we have to do is just accept that instead of using a car for 20 years, now you have to use it for five or seven years at most. But that's not something we can do for infrastructure. And that's because we design infrastructure to last 100, 200 years. If you think of Thames Tideway, a huge concrete pipe under London, that thing would not be of value if it was created just for 50 years. We have to design it for 200. As a result of that, that concrete pipe is going to see probably 40 different generations of technologies before it reaches its end of life. That's why we need future proofing. And for the same reason, that's why we need scalability, because we have big assets with a lot of complexities and we need to be able to scale them over time. Um, so why do we need digital twins? Well, because the promise of a digital twin is better decisions, faster. Faster refresh rate, more trust in the information, the ability to serve multiple processes, more automation, pushing the low level decisions to the subconscious and leaving the high level decisions to the humans. To explain this better, think of an autonomous car. An autonomous car is able to be autonomous because every single decision it has to make is a low level enough decision that software can manage it reliably. Therefore, that means that the twin system loop becomes fully automated for these types of decisions. It is the high level decisions where we still need to bring a human on board, although with AI and how AI is developing, uh, that reduces um, the reasons why a human needs to be involved more and more every day. So if digital twins then are so amazing, why aren't they as ubiquitous as a physical twin? Well, that's because we know the physical twin is a product and process. We know buildings, bridges, tunnels, and we know how to design them, construct them, operate them, maintain them. But we're still discovering digital twins as a product and process, both as a data structure and how to design, build, operate, maintain them. And we need a lot of R&D to do that. And with that, happy to extend an invite. We have several open positions for graduate studies at Cambridge, 
exactly in this area. Uh, so you're very welcome if this is an area that excites you to apply for them. Another aspect is that owners understand the value of physical twins, but not the value of digital twins. And owners need real use cases to help achieve rapid market penetration. And last but not least, vendors are presenting incremental solutions as groundbreaking by enhancing current products, relabeling them as a digital twin, and therefore accelerating digital twins into the trough of disillusionment. Um, so what I've tried to do instead is on one side to acknowledge that industry is making progress, and they are. Every single day, we're doing a little bit better. But at the same time, to come back with a different message for everyone. The industry says, we have digital twins. They're here right now, use them. My response is, we have something that resembles a digital twin, maybe 10% of it, but we're still missing another 90% of it. Let's discover what that 90% is. That's where research comes in. And this is what you see here in this figure. This is um, my attempt together with a colleague from uh, Technion, Professor Raphael Sachs, to try to understand the potential of a digital twin. So to understand this figure, imagine a human standing in front of a lake. So on the positive axis, you have the physical product and process. And then on the negative axis, you have the reflection of this human, which is the, the digital aspect of it, the information volume. And so if we go across the timeline, we start with planning and design physical processes that produce design phase product and process information. That's what we call the design phase digital twin or the fetal, the unborn digital twin uh, that happens before construction starts. So lesson number one, the digital twin appears before the physical twin appears. Between the two twins, it's the older twin. Then we hit birth. That's when prefabrication starts, construction processes kick in, the prefabricated parts start coming out. Eventually, we reach the weaning stage where we leave the mothership and we go on site to start installing everything and creating the, the building or the bridge or any other asset. Uh, that's when all the temporary works kick in and we start producing this physical twin, which is at the child stage. Child meaning it grows from nothing into an adult throughout the construction process up until maturation, which is the project handover phase. Throughout that process, we are producing construction phase product and process information. And as you can imagine, later on at the operation stage, we have the adult physical twin supported by operation processes producing operation phase product and process information. And at the end of all this, we recycle and reuse the building or the bridge or in any other asset at its end of life. But the digital twin doesn't have to die. That's the big difference with the human. When the human body dies, unfortunately, we also lose the brain. In the case of the digital twin, the asset can die at its end of life, but the digital twin can stay on and survive and help us learn how to do things better in the future. Another very interesting element is that you might notice that the digital twin never stops growing. The physical twin grows up to a certain point and then stops like a human does. But the digital twin keeps growing throughout life because it's like the wisdom. Human wisdom keeps growing forever. This is what is reflected here. Another thing that's very important to highlight is uh, this is a really good slide to explain the difference between a building information model and a digital twin. Because many people ask, so what's the difference? What's the difference between BIM and digital twins? Well, here's the difference. When most people say BIM, what they mean is design phase product information at a single instance in time, a static model. And if you're very lucky, you might also get a design status model with a design phase process information or a construction um, 
uh, an S-built BIM, which is the construction phase product information, or a project status model with the construction phase process information. If you have all these things, you're still quite advanced uh, in today's age. But again, most of these sit at separate software platforms that don't talk to each other. There is no integration. That's one of the big challenges. So only recently we started to see some efforts to bring these things together with software that allows these systems to talk to each other. But even if we manage to achieve that, and I can say we haven't quite finished this work, we are still not achieving the potential. And the potential is this the green shade that you see here. See, the physical twin cannot go back in time or forward in time, but a digital twin can go back in time and forward in time, and that's where its power sits. Because if I have a good digital twin, I can go back in time and do forensics. Why did something fail? What decision did I make in the past which might have caused something to fail? And likewise, I can go forward into the future and make predictions and forecasting and understand what are the consequences of my decisions. That's the whole value of a digital twin, and that's why it has to be dynamic as opposed to a static model. Some other fundamentals of digital twins. Uh, digital twins are made of information derived from data held separately and deleted after use. Um, this information can then be interpolated to discover information patterns, which is knowledge, and then extrapolated through the knowledge patterns to provide insight. All of these tasks, going from data to information to knowledge to insight, are perfect AI use cases. And this is why AI is so important for digital twins. It allows us to transcend these steps. Um, and this is perhaps the most important slide I have for you today. I, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I'm, I'm making it more clear now. Right now, we know how to plan, design, construct, and operate a physical asset. We know how to do that for a building, for a bridge, for any one of these. We don't know how to do the same things for the digital twin of that same asset. How do we plan a digital twin? How do we understand its scope, its feasibility and costs? How do we design one? How we derive the digital twin asset class? Think of hospitals, roads, buildings. How do we design the data structures and the cloud architectures appropriate? And then under digital twin construction, how do I populate this class to derive a specific asset instance? This road, this building, this hospital. How do I then update that instance over time at varying sampling rates per attribute to maintain that digital twin and make it a true dynamic model? And most importantly of all, the first four things are all cost, no value. It's all doing things for the sake of the digital twin. The value only comes from the last one. So the most important one is how do I operate that digital twin to actually get value. These are all open-ended questions which look for answers and this is why we need to do research to address all of these. So uh, I'll stop with the theory here because I've gone too theoretical on you and I'll start presenting some more specific examples which I hope you'll appreciate more on things we've done so, fa uh, so far to solve some of these problems specifically in the space of constructing digital twins. So what do we mean by constructing digital twins? Well, I have an asset like this bridge. I somehow go there and scan it uh, and get its points and pixels and thermals and other modalities. I then automatically convert these into objects. Then I put all these modalities on tops, the visuals, the thermals and others, and I start detecting additional information such as condition information. Right? So. Let's see how we can do that. Step one, extracting raw geometry. We've done a lot of work on that, and we came up with a method called mid-range mobile videogrammetry that allows us to optimize 
the bundle adjustment process by leveraging stronger features we have in the environment, which is uh, lines and planes, not just points, because the built environment has a lot of very strong lines and planes. By doing that, we now have the capability to pick up a mobile phone and use the app that was created for this and, and scan an asset from 25 meters away and get a point cloud with a sub centimeter error. This has now been commercialized in the US through a startup called Pointivo. Once we've created the point cloud, we can equalize the densities, we can fix the points, um, and then have a good quality point cloud. We also go a step beyond that and say, well, why just points? I can bring in points and RGB and near infrared and you know thermal and other data all from the same scan and automatically register them on top of each other. You can see here an experiment we did at the Whiteley site in London together with Lengo Rourke, where you have the student using our clunky prototype to get all the data synchronized both in space and time, but also the ability to do real-time accuracy predictions. So as he goes along, uh, you can see here green is high accuracy, uh, and then red is low accuracy. And the person who's doing the scan can see that prediction in real time. What this allows him to do is to then find the pathway to get back from red to green. And every time he does that, we, what happens is what we call a loop closure that decreases uncertainty. As soon as that happens, you see that the predictions are updated instantly. And so he can do then multiple loop closures and continue to do this process until everything is um, green within the whole space. This is quality assurance for the person doing the inspection. So I got my good quality data now, my points and pixels and thermals. What comes next? Well, what comes next is finding ways to automatically generate the geometric digital twin. Now, that's a difficult thing, right? Because for every day of scanning, people then have to spend 10 days modeling that thing into objects with massive data sets. Think of point clouds with over 30 billion points. We don't have a computer today that can open that file. And most importantly, with significant modeler fatigue. I mean, imagine how boring it must be to model pipe after pipe, valve after valve, um, that's not something you want to repeat. And, and clearly, that's a problem that screams for automation. You can see the example here, this reactor building, 40 billion points. It took 10 people six months to make the model. So what we've done in this space is we started a long time ago with simple methods, uh, detecting columns from a webcam and a laptop. Zoom in 10 years later, now we have solved this problem for bridges. We can take any bridge and from its point cloud and images automatically give you the object oriented model of that asset. Uh, it's very important to highlight that we can do this for real bridges with all kinds of skews and peculiarities. No bridge is straight, no component is straight, and yet we can do that very reliably. Uh, in essence, we can go from this, which is points and pixels, to detected objects, and then from detected objects directly to a model. We can do the same for buildings. Uh, this is the process we call formalizing the digital twin generation process for a building. And in this work, effectively, it's a slightly harder problem because for buildings, unlike bridges where everything is exposed, in the building we try to hide things. Um, what we can use here to infer what's behind is basic uh, engineering and architectural priors of the building. So think about it this way. If I have a point cloud of a building, I know a building is made out of floors, so I can go and segment the floors. Once I segment the floors, I know a floor is made out of rooms. So all I have to do is uh, detect the rooms within the floor. And then once I find the rooms, I can make a safe assumption that there's probably a ceiling above me and a floor below me. There's probably walls around me and so on. 
and I can do this hierarchical decomposition process. This is what you see here, detecting floors and ceilings, slabs effectively, even in the presence of clutter, uh, detecting uh, walls and spaces and creating the model without any human intervention. We've done the same thing recently for industrial facilities, capturing cylinders, elbows, flanges, eye beams, channels. Uh, again, with a very bottom up deep learning uh, approach. Uh, but in addition to that, we're using the mechanical priors here to connect the mechanical systems and find the in between issues so that we can produce a really high quality model by the end of that process. Um, We've also done a lot of work on the next step, which is then enriching that digital twin, in this case with condition information. We've done a project, for example, on enriching with condition data. You see here the digital twin of a bridge where we can detect a number of different components and automatically measure the problems and assign those measurements directly on the defect. We've also done the same for roads. So as you drive forward, we can capture the cracks, uh, the uh, patches, potholes and other problems. Uh, we have many of these in uh, the UK, as you know. And once you've captured these, you can measure them and automatically send them back to the model uh, so that these can be repaired. Uh, this is actually quite an old piece of work and it's now commercialized through multiple car companies. Uh, Mercedes is right now selling this data to national highways. Um, another thing we've done is try to bring in sensor data, fiber optics, strain gauges directly into the model so that we can model the sensors and link the time series data so that you can see what the outcome is. Remember, a twin system involves the connectivity. And it is that connectivity that allows us to do this. This is an actual bridge in Staffordshire where we've created the digital twin. And as the trains are passing on top, we can see the strains along the different components coming back into the model uh, directly as a result of this action. Where we want to go in the long term is uh, what we call the national digital twin. Imagine if I can make the same thing for every single asset in the UK. Imagine if the whole um, rail network, uh, uh, all the underground in London, all of these public transit facilities had been modeled. There was a digital twin for everything that is constantly updated and can be used to maintain the asset better, to operate the asset better and get the most value out of that asset. That's what we want to achieve. Um, and having said that, I want to say a few things about how we exploit this digital twin, because that's the point of making it if it doesn't give me some value. The first example I have here is on a project on digitally enabling the design for manufacture, assembly and maintenance of bridges. This project happened um, when uh, High Speed 2, uh, the rail line from London to Birmingham, was starting to emerge. That's a project that has about 300 bridges or so. And what those bridges have in common is that none of them are iconic. You want to build them on time, on budget, maximum certainty, minimum disruption. And to do that, off-site manufacturing sounds like a great solution. I create the components of site, bring them to site, quickly assemble and move on. The problem is that the process for delivering bridges was built around the bespoke model. So the first thing we had to do was try to understand every single decision that has to happen from route alignment all the way to a delivered bridge. And once we've mapped these decisions, we can then map the links between those decisions. So basically what data does do I need in each and every case to make that decision? And where is that data coming out of? Which other decision and so on? And in doing so, what we learned was two things. The first was, what are the decisions that need to move on earlier in the process to enable offsite manufacturing? For example, if we move the choice of crane earlier on in the process, and I know the weight capacity of my crane, I can then design components that are below that weight capacity. 
Uh, the second thing we learned is we now understand all the control variables and all the dependent variables. And unsurprisingly, for your typical highway overpass, the number of control variables are very, very small. It's something like 16. But the benefit of knowing that is that that allowed us to create a design automation solution, which is all the red arrows you see here, so that our design partner, Tony G, could sit together with uh, their customer, High Speed 2, ask them those 16 questions, put the numbers in, click a button, and get a Pareto optimal of different solutions that satisfy those conditions. Before this tool, Tony G took about seven weeks to produce one solution. Now it takes two minutes to produce 100 solutions. That's the difference. That's the power of these tools. Um, another value is bringing the digital twin onto the construction phase. See, if I have a schedule loaded model like this dynamic twin that tells me that on this date, all the components you see should have been built, I can then very quickly do a volumetric comparison, find out everything that's missing, and mark everything accordingly. So everything that's green, that's on schedule, everything that's red, that's behind schedule, and everything that's orange is under construction. And I can bring that information back into the model without the human having to do this manually. Um, we've also brought the digital twins onto the offsite factory itself. You see here one of the offsite factories of Langururk, and you can see a construction worker who is building a rebar cage. We've created these trackers, multiple trackers, that allows us to very reliably track him, even if you only see a little bit of him. Uh, and when he leaves the view, we can track him again uh, and bring him back into the process. Uh, so that for every component he's working on and he marks on his screen, we can then link the tracking data back to that uh, rebar cage, back to that component. So we can have component level productivity information. But beyond that, another thing we saw in this project is that this person spent 60% of his time measuring and consulting the model. And we thought, well, what a waste of productivity. Instead, what we want to do is bring the model right in front of him and allow him to build the component directly from the model without ever having to use a tape measure. Instead, we can use our augmented reality tools to do the measuring for him and tell him in real time if one of the components is the wrong one or if it's been placed in the wrong position. Um, we then started to go a step further with robotic teleoperation. I don't know if you've seen this movie, Real Steel, where Hugh Jackman pretends to be a boxer, but he's not actually doing any of the boxing. Um, when I watched this movie, I, I thought, well, why a boxer? Why not a construction worker? Imagine if we had a worker like that. I don't need cranes anymore. I can just pick up a huge steel beam and carry it around. So no safety problems anymore no physical human limitations. This thing can do anything I want to do it. Um, and we started to make this robotic teleoperation look possible. This is the example you see here through our robotic construction worker. Very simple project. One student who created the computer vision tools to monitor the fingers, the hands in detail, and use that to remotely control this virtual worker to pick up a row of bricks, put them in place, uh, pick up a spade, uh, put some mortar on, another row of bricks, then pick up a hammer, align the bricks and so on, um, and generally do all the activities that a bricklayer would do without actually having to do that job themselves. So if you've ever played any Kinect games, uh, you can think of this as Kinect bricklayer. Um, we've also done some work in the operations and maintenance phase to bring the digital twin on top of the physical twin and allow us to access information reliably. Uh, we created the registration tools that allow us to uh, keep the virtual model as tightly linked to the physical model as possible. 
but also we can use augmented reality to bring other digital twins of other assets like the bridges we were discussing before back in the office. So you can actually uh, look at the problems uh, on the spot there without having to go on the physical asset or to use virtual reality to do this. If you ever come to visit us at Cambridge, I'd be happy to put you into this virtual reality environment to walk through this model and understand all the issues of these components without actually having to visit the real asset. The last example I have for you, and then I'll, I'll try to quickly go over some current activity, is on the matter of asset protection. This came to us as a problem from London Underground and from the US, from the Georgia Department of Transportation, who told us a very surprising statistic. A bridge, sorry, a truck hits a bridge uh, once every four hours in the UK. Now, most of these hits are just a minor scrape and nothing really ever happens, but quite a lot of these are serious hits. And specifically, London Underground told us that their top 10 most hit bridges get hit once a week. Uh, yet, when we told them, why aren't you doing anything about this? They told us that the existing solutions that included building uh, deliberate crash barriers before the bridge or uh, adding uh, laser uh, solutions that require building street poles on each side so that you can put a uh, uh, laser beam in between. Those things cost multiple hundred thousand pounds and they decided to be honest that they would rather let the trucks keep hitting. It's too expensive. What we did for them instead is this solution that simply uses one camera upstream in traffic somewhere on an existing street pole that is mounted exactly at the overheight plane. At that plane, the overheight uh, plane in the camera view appears as a line. So anything above that line is seen as overheight. Anything below that line is seen as normal. Uh, that allows us to detect the overheight vehicles, signal for the warning side to flash with an audible alarm in case uh, such a vehicle appears, give them an opportunity to exit, and if they don't exit and they hit the bridge, we detect the hit and then we let the camera system know to keep that recording and capture the license plate of that particular vehicle that just crossed that bridge so that London Underground can go and charge the offender. Um, you can see here how this works at uh, the Fairlop station, uh, the camera uh, mounted up high uh, and us allowing us to capture the overhead vehicles there. Now, since then, very briefly, we've done a lot of other projects on uh, cloud building information modeling to generate geometry, enrich the product and model the process and build a number of applications. On the transition from BIM to TWIN, as this grant is called, to allow us to do construction using this time a digital twin as opposed to a BIM model for various construction uh, tasks. On bringing this loop we discussed before uh, to the road sector with Omicron, uh, with digital inspection, the road digital twin, the decision support, and the smart construction interventions. Uh, and you can see here specifically our work on creating the architecture for the digital twin. Uh, and last but not least, I'm going to leave you with our long term vision. We want to see every asset out there of the built environment as a combination of physical and digital and product versus process and try to do significant advancements across the quadrants, but also on the arrows that connect them. Think of the physical product. We want to make the existing uh, materials, inert materials into smart materials, aware of their state and properties, assisting their maintainers and users. We want to take our existing physical processes and automate them, construction, maintenance, and so on. We want to do all the things we discussed earlier 
on the digital product side about digital twins to plan, design, maintain, and operate. And last but not least, under digital process, we want to take data out of smart materials through the robotics into the digital twin, combine it with everything else, and use that to drive insight with data science to inform design, construction, maintenance, and operations. I'll stop there and just a little um, advert for a book I published on infrastructure computer vision with a colleague from Canada, Professor Carl Haas. Um, some acknowledgements on the people who did the work at the bottom and those that paid for it at the top, and to invite any questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Brilakis. Uh, this is uh, very, very educative. Uh, we've learned quite a lot from the lecture, and uh, we can see the fantastic work that you've been doing, you and your team, uh, from the University of Cambridge. So I will hand over to my colleague, uh, Donna, here, who, who has been monitoring the chat. So read out any question that our audience uh, might have. And uh, after that, I will hand over to our, our head of which environment who is going to run it off uh, after the after the question and answer. So thank you very much uh, once again. And to the audience, uh, this is being recorded and you are going to be receiving the uh, the video of the event after the lecture uh, very soon. So do now we hand over to you to read yeah, out the no question. Prob no problem. Thanks, Sahid. Um, thanks, Professor. That was really interesting. Um, it looks like we've got some more sort of comments than actual questions. Um, we've got a, a comment here from um, Lawrence Chapman saying that on the Transperinine route, Upgrade Digital Twin, we designed our program so that we released value at different points along our digital twin journey. Therefore, the program became self-funding through tangible benefits achieved. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Professor. I, uh, yeah, I think that's the right thing that they did. And this is what you want to do. If you can show value early on, it's very easy to excite the rest of the process and the clients involved to uh, keep with that journey and then bring it forward and deliver an asset that's almost entirely delivered digitally before it is delivered physically. This is what we want to do. We want to predict, anticipate, let all the bad options die in the model so that we only act upon the most viable ones in the real world. Brilliant. And then we've got another another comment here for you. Um, it is increasingly clear that the digital twin is not a cost, but an investment to aim for. How organisations can establish effective data governance practices to ensure the quality and integrity of the data used to enable digital twins to allow them to become effective tools for producing data driven decisions, actions and therefore an interesting ROI. What are your thoughts on that, Professor? Uh, my thought is that the software industry, the construction IT software industry, has done a very good job at convincing everyone else that it's their fault that the tools are not good. Um, and as a result, many companies are asking these questions. How can we set the proper data governance processes and how can we train everyone and all that? And my thinking is that that's actually the job of the IT sector, because the IT sector understands data governance and they should be working on that. When it comes to the construction sector, we are builders. We want to design, we want to build, we want to deliver. That's where we want to focus on. We don't want to be spending our time getting into the IT side and the IT specifics. I mean, unless we want to transition completely, become an IT company. But if we don't, we just want those tools to work. And this doesn't happen today. The best example I can give you is I went to um, India a few years back in Chennai and we visited the headquarters of Larson and Tubro. And in that amazing campus, the biggest building was a massive building full of classrooms teaching BIM. And I asked them, why are you teaching so much BIM? And, and the only thing they could think of is that, well, we have a high turnover. We have a lot of people who come to us for two years and then they leave, so we have to keep educating. They, it never crossed their mind that the reason they need to do so much education is because the software is crap. 
I mean, the exact opposite of this is our mobile phone. Uh, we don't have to be trained to use our mobile phone. When my daughter was one years old, she learned how to unlock my phone and fire her Peppa Pig up and start playing. So getting value right there without any problem, um, without any training. This is not by accident. Uh, the Android ecosystem, the Apple ecosystem and so on, they have been very deliberately designed so that you can get value fast. This is not the case with the software in our industry. And when I discussed this with the IT providers on our side, and, and all of us know who are those well-known companies, uh, one of them was honest enough to say, well, why do you think this is the case? He said, just like in civil engineering, where our top graduates go to the big name brands, the Arabs and the Mots and so on, but our not so top graduates go to the smaller consultancies. The same thing happens in computer science. The top name grads would go to Microsoft, to Google, to Apple, and, and so on. And who does Autodesk, Bentley Systems, and Trimble get? The leftovers. I still think, though, that that's an excuse. Uh, I, I don't think it's a people matter because I think if people are directed properly, they can produce amazing things. Uh, and I think we as an industry, the consultants, the contractors, the clients have to demand more out of the IT system because only then can we actually solve these problems. That's great. Thank you, Professor. Um, I think our um, our Dean of School would actually like to ask you a question. So I'm just going to unmute Akin just so that he can ask you his question. I'll just do that now. Ah, here we go. I'll just. I think you might be on mute, Akin. Are you able to unmute yourself? Thank you for the presentation. And it's fantastic in terms of the amount of information that you have provided. Um, most of the work that you do, again, you've been doing a lot of work with large organizations and also uh, collecting data through all the things that you have done. The industry will have a lot of small, medium enterprise. And also, you talk about data collection, how data will drive the process. How do we reconcile that in, in terms of the fact that we have a lot of small, medium enterprises and also the kind of data that might be required for us to be able to drive the industry? I'm not talking about the industry now, particularly construction industry and in terms of data analytics and the way we work together from your own perspective and the work that you have done how do we do that how do we engage the small medium enterprise in terms of we've seen that in terms of being trying to encourage them on projects and try to bring them together the question is always that how do you do it what are the things we need to put in place? And also in terms of training as well, what sort of training should we be giving to our students for them to be able to engage with all this? Should we be teaching more of IT in terms of our provision or should we rely on the specialist in computer science for them to provide the, the IT requirements and for us to do what we are good at? In terms of uh, construction processes, you mentioned about processes, you mentioned about product. How do we bring all this together from your own uh, perspective? I'll do my best to answer the question. Thank you for the question. Um, I'll start with the education side. Uh, th there is no doubt, of course, that even those of us who wish to focus on designing, constructing, operating existing assets, of course, we need to understand the tools that we have in our availability to use. And uh, right now we have no choice. No matter what software we have, we have to learn how to use them because there is value to receive from these tools. There is a reason why they're being used. Uh, there is a lot of value through them. So uh, this is a big weakness of universities. Most universities focus on very traditional civil engineering and architecture education and not enough on the informatics education. That's the reality these days in the real world. And so we do need to introduce a lot more 
um, teaching and learning within that ecosystem. Uh, having said that, I'm going to go back to the obligations of the IT community that there is a lot of room for improvement on existing tools, significant room for improvement. Um, and in other industries, that's not as big of an issue. So think of the car industry. Uh, Mercedes builds their own software, but they don't need uh, someone else to develop it for them. But like you said, we have many small players and those small players, which is the vast majority, in fact, of construction, they don't have R&D budgets. They don't have the ability to build in-house tools. They have to rely on existing practices and software. Uh, but at the same time, that's that problem is an opportunity for the startup sector because the startup companies who realize that there is a lot of money to be made from all of these small players that can't afford to do R&D, but actually have the same needs because they're doing the same things across the board. Uh, they can go and build that software for them and give them that value the same way you have you know, QuickBooks for tax and, you know, money management uh, have equivalent software for information management for the sector. Um, and then in that way, help all the small players and also uh, make quite a healthy profit along the way. So a lot of the startups I work with these days, that's where I target them. I tell them the big opportunities in retail IT software for the smaller players, which is the vast majority of the industry. The large players anyway, they have the same mentality and the mentality is I will do what the client asks. So if I want, let's say, uh, Costain or Amy to do something on highways, all I have to do is ask National Highways to do it. Right. And if National Highways says so, they will do it. That's it. Um, but that's not the way to solve it for every type of business. We need to be able to build tools that operate almost on a retail basis. I think the the aspect also, which again, which is always a, a major concern for me, is a, is around data, and also in terms of the credibility of the data informing our decision making process. And we know that data science is becoming important to us, and for us as a school, it's, it's an area where we have grown. But how do you encourage these small medium enterprises, and how do we capture the data that they produce day to day? What are the things we need to put in place? It's always a major concern for me, and it's something that the industry will need to look at and also come together to be able to start addressing those issues, which our small medium enterprises, which constitute more than 80% of the industry in terms of registration, what they need to do, how we work with them for them to be able to, to announce all those things that you have mentioned here in your presentation. Again, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, great, we've got some, we've got a couple more minutes, if that's okay to do a couple more questions. Saheed, is that okay? Yeah, um, that, that's fine if uh, Professor Brilakis is happy to stay for a little more minutes. Um, is that okay, sure, Professor? Sure, you have another questions, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Great. Thank you. Uh, okay, we've got one here. Um, it appears there is a resemblance of DT in integrated digital delivery. What are your thoughts about this? Uh, my thought is that one of the disservices we have provided to the greater construction community is we have we have become quite verbose in the vocabulary that we use to explain the same things. Um, and rather than trying to make our vocabulary more specific, to allow us to uh, be precise in our wording, we try to use words interchangeably. Data and information, what's the difference? It's the same thing, it's not. Uh, BIM digital twins, what's the difference? It's the same thing, it's not and so on and so on. Um, so uh, the question is, if there's not just a resemblance, it's really the same thing. And I wish we can agree someday on using the same terms because that will really help the industry. Great, thanks, Professor. Um, are we OK to just take one more? Is that OK? Um, 
Is replicability possible in all continents and deplorable to all projects? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. If maybe the person who asked for it can provide a bit more context if they're in the call. Yeah, I think uh, this question is about uh, the the other part of the world uh, in terms of the technological capability and um, different building types and the like how things vary across uh, the whole world. So is, is this same thing that we are doing in the UK also possible in the other part of the world and can they deploy it uh, equally? I understand. He meant deployable, not deployable. Yeah, Sorry. deployable, yes. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Um, so uh, the answer is absolutely. I mean, those tools work the same everywhere. There is no limitation. And uh, in fact, the more I see what's happening, uh, I think I don't think those tools are going to come from the UK. I've been extremely impressed with the work that's going on in Hong Kong, in China or other parts of Asia um, where there is significant more development. And for them, time really means money and delays are not something that people can live with. Um, I was recently in Hong Kong and they showed us some uh, building construction projects for housing in a single project, 96,000 people. That's almost the size of Cambridge in one construction project. Um, and then we were told that this that particular site from planning all the way to delivery to the customer, three years. I mean, this is unthinkable in the UK to go through planning, design, construction and deliver the whole thing in under three years. Um, we are well behind the curve in this country and, and we have to start looking around the world to see for how we can progress. We are now a follower, we're not a leader anymore. But I think we need to stop at this point. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we hand over to our head of subject, uh, Mark Wilson, who we just uh, help us to, to close it. Thanks, Saeed. And thank you, Professor Mirilakis. That was really interesting. Uh, a nice concept about um, the digital twin and an introduction to the fact that we might be able to time travel as well through the future proofing to bring us to look backwards in time to see what went wrong in the construction progress and look forwards in time then to enable us to to put things right before we actually get to those problems. So it was really nice to, to be able to, to bridge the virtual reality into the actual reality that we've got. Um, I thought your concepts of automation and things should really be used to increase leisure time and not increase profit, but that's more of a, an existential debate, I suspect. Um, and I think the best way to get things driving forward as far as the IT is concerned and the data and all those other sides is to get the client to understand that we're going to make a saving here and it's going to be better for them and it's going to give them a better product at the end of it. Because if they start to want to use this, then the bigger companies like you say Microsoft and Apple are going to get behind that and they're going to, that's where the money is going to come from. And I think if we can get the clients to understand it's OK, like you say, the contractor's trying to get this online, but the clients are the ones that are going to drive it because they're the ones that are going to be asking for it. So, and and I, I love the idea that we can use the virtual twin to identify where we're dropping behind on programme to see whether, whether you know, I saw the bit that had all the green parts and the red parts that were slightly behind programme. That gives the project manager a lot of support to do that. Um, I've, I've learned a real a real great amount there today, Professor Brilakis, and it's been really fantastic and engaging. So thank you very much for your time. And thank you for everybody else that's attended today as well. I mean, we, we are doing these on a bi-monthly basis and the next one is in, in March. So um, if it's going to be as interesting as this one, I'm really looking forward to the March one. And I hope to see the rest of you here as well. And, and you too as well, Professor Brilakis. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Goodbye now.